Welcome, pole vault coaches, athletes, and enthusiasts to this week's pole vault coaching series featuring Stacy Dergila, your 2000 uh, Olympic gold medalist. And so we're going to get into it right away this evening. Um, and Stacy has lots of great information to share with us. So I'm going to hand it over to her to let her kind of introduce her story and then take us through some technical bits of uh, the pole vault. So Stacy, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Joel. Hey, everybody. Um, super excited to be here tonight, uh, being a part of the coaching series. Uh, thanks for the invite to all the coaches that allowed me to come on and, and talk a little bit about the experiences I've had and the things that have helped me become um, a good vaulter and have longevity in the sport. Um, it's It's been a lot of fun, obviously. I'm, I'm coaching now, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I know for a lot of you that haven't had a season, I, I really feel for you, especially our seniors out there talking with a lot of the coaches at the college level, high school level. It's, it's been really, really hard on you guys. And I just want you to know we're all thinking of you and want you to keep your chin up. And, you know, there's going to be better days out there. There's going to be more bars to, to clear. So just do what you can at home and, and be creative with some of your training. And hopefully I can give you some tidbits to help that help that along the way. Um, some of you are young enough and you might not even know who I am. Like Joel said, I am the first Olympic women's pole vault champion. Um, I was a world record holder, American record holder, and those things have um, been, been taken from other people and that's okay. That's how life goes and that's how sport goes. But, you know, nobody could take my gold medal away and I have it here and I love sharing it and showing it. And um, it's been a real fun thing to be a part of my life and taken me um, to a lot of great places and have met so many great people along the way. Um, so some of you don't know what my jump looks like. I'm a left-handed pole vaulter. Um, you know, I'm critical of my own jump. I don't think my jump is perfect, but I made it work and I made it work to break a lot of records and American records. So if we're looking for the perfect model, um, I have to say that you know, it's nice to look for that perfect model, but just know that we have to work in, in the realm that we, that we have, the strengths that we have, and work on the weaknesses that we have. And so don't beat yourself up if something's not perfect. Um, keep working towards that ultimate goal, that ultimate model, but know that a lot of great things can happen um, outside of it. So I'm just going to show you a real short clip of um, some of my friends that I got to compete with and just a short video of who, who I was as a vaulter and then We'll go into the segment. Mary Lou Retton. Well, that wasn't the story for me. But I thought, oh, I'd be a hurdler. Well, that wasn't it. I wasn't fast enough. <laughs> My motto is to dream big. You never know when you're going to find your niche. Just being outside on the range, I learned to grow physically strong just with the elements that I was surrounded with. Being a part of high school rodeo, having no fear attitude, I think those things really played a big part in the way I grew up and, and how I've excelled in sports. jump at the Olympics that was one of the videos and I think the other one was the Olympic trials to make to make the team um, my PR is was 15 10 and three quarters right right shy of, of 16 feet um, I had attempted it several times and probably just 
wasn't gripping high enough. Um, I tended to take off under, and those are the things I needed to work on in, in my training um, throughout my career. And um, But all along, I wouldn't tr trade anything, you know, uh, change anything for, for the experiences I had. Um, like the video showed, um, I think this is a really great time for me to kind of tell a little bit about my story. Um, I, I was 23 when I started pole vaulting. A lot of people start a lot younger, right? Obviously, eighth grade, ninth grade, start dabbling into it. But I was 23 years old. Um, women did not pole vault before that. So when my coach came to me at the University of um, or Idaho State, um, I was a heptathlete for him, and I was going to go do one of these long fall workouts. Um, and he came jogging down to the track, all excited. And he came over to the heptathletes and he asked us to try the pole vault for the first time. And I, I looked around, I thought, are you talking to us? And he said, yeah, I just got off the internet. I saw results for, um, for the Chinese and the Russians. They just held a meet in, in Europe. And I think women can do the pole vault. So um, he basically conned us into doing it. And um, he, he told us, if you try it for a little while, I'll cut that workout in half. And that's basically why I tried it. I had no idea, I had no inclination that women could pole vault at the time. And so I just, I did it on a whim and I really didn't know where it was gonna go. Um, so a couple of weeks would go by, Dave would, would pull out a pole again. I forgot how to hold it, how to run with it, how to jump over the tip. And we would just start slowly like that. And um, slowly but surely we started gravitating to the long jump pit and then finally went into the pit itself and started swinging to our back. And I'm not gonna lie, I was really scared to, to swing to my back. Um, I'm not a gymnast by any means. I did a little bit at the YMCA when I was a kid, but we never got to the stunts and throwing tricks, back, back tucks, front, front flips or anything. So all of that was really kind of scary for me. But fortunate for me, there was a gym two, two blocks from the university. And when Dave noticed that I was a little bit reluctant to swing and be um, all in, he said, okay, we need to start spending some time down at the gym. And I think for me, those, those times in the gym, working on my upper body strength and allowing myself to get my feet in the air, my hips in the air, started helping me connect the dots in pole, vault, pole vaulting. Um, you know, I, I learned how to pole vault straight pulling initially. And so the connection for me felt very similar to some of the gymnastics moves that, that, um, that I'm going to show you. So the whole part of my presentation is talking about gymnastics. Um, I know not all of you do gymnastics. I'm not saying you have to go out and do gymnastics, but if you have some of these pieces of equipment, a, a pair of rings can cost $50 and you can have a good set of rings. You could go hang them in a tree in your, in your home, you know, near your home, in a park, once things start opening up and you can start dabbling in some of these exercises. Um, for the females out there, we lack the upper body strength. We lack that shoulder girdle strength. And so for the lats and the shoulders, the back, it's really important that we focus on some of these um, exercises. And for me, once I went into the gym, it, it was fun for me. It never felt like it was training. It kind of brought a little bit of that childhood memory back that I could play, that I could swing. And I never felt like it was, you know, real hard work. I mean, even though I'd go home and my arms would be pumped, I would have blisters sometimes from doing a lot of reps. Um, it just was another a fun part of my training process, which, which kept it fun for me. So I'm gonna talk about postural gymnastics for the vault. Um, this is one of my athletes. He did a lot of the videos for me, so I appreciate that. A shout out to Steve, Steven Puss for doing this for me. I had a lot of different videos and then I kind of went through and I wanted to make sure I had really good quality videos. We went back down these last week and a half and shot again. Um, but basically we're trading after we run and after we work on the run. I mean, I know a lot of the coaches have already come on and talked about you know, the, the primary principles of pole vaulting. We need, ha need to learn how to run mechanically sound. We need to learn how to run um, with the pole and be in good condition and good balance. And then once we basically take off, we're a gymnast on a pole. And some of us are ex-gymnasts and that's phenomenal. And some of us aren't. So do we have to be a, a gymnast to be a pole vaulter? Absolutely not. But if we can use some of these elements in our training, I think we could all get better from it. So what, what you see here on this first side um, on, the, on the left is, I call it a dynamic C, and a lot of you have read literature and different books. I, I reference um, pole vault training, um, 
a lot. This was Vitaly and um, and his, his gymnastics coach, and they wrote this when Yelena was training with them. There's a lot of great information in there. Some of it's a little bit over your head, but some of it is really clear and precise, and you can pull a lot of great information from that. Another book that I reference a lot is uh, From Beginner to Bootka. I've had this book for a lot of time, a lot of years. I've tabbed different places along along the book, and I and I pull information all the time, verbiage. I feel like a lot of us do talk a lot of different language, and so something that I'm going to say today is probably going to be like, "What are you talking about?" And your coach might say it a little bit differently. So, feel free to, you know, write into YouTube and just kind of help with clarification if if I get you um, confused at all. But going back to the backward C, if we can create this stretch at takeoff, you are an elastic band, right? I'm sure you've heard this a hundred times. For those young pole vault coaches, we want to create this position at takeoff. Um, from, from your hand all the way through your shoulder to your chest, all the way down to the foot at takeoff. If we can run up off the ground and create a nice stretch, you are going to load the pole a lot better if you just jump up off the ground and, and create nothing or if you're under and have that lack of stretch there. So we're looking for this really dynamic position at takeoff. And then on the right side, he's pushing back out. He's pushing the pole away from him. If he had a pole in his hand and he's trying to get the pole to move to vertical. So this was kind of nice to kind of just melt right into our world record holder, Mondo Duplantis. As you remember what Steven's position was, he was really nice and stretched. He created that backward C, much like Mondo is doing right here. He has space between um, his head and his bottom arm, and he's keeping upward pressure on his hand. That backward C, he is ready to run off the ground and tap. We call it tap to the top. And so as we go through these next couple uh, slides, we'll be able to see it in, a, in more motion. I guess before we go on, we have to have a coach's challenge thrown out there. So um, I like to train still. I'm not at the top of my game, but I enjoy a challenge once in a while. So I'm calling out all the coaches out there. What's your best drill? And I guess for me right now, it's my swing. <laughs> I, can't, I can't run very fast, but I could still tap a pretty good swing on the ring. So let's check it out. What we're looking for here is that we're trying to keep a very straight body, um, create as much energy as we can through the rings all the way down to my feet. And as I whip through the front side, I'm trying to stay as straight as a lever as possible. Um, if I lose that position, if I break at my hips, I lose a lot of energy. We call that sitting in the bucket. So as you can see, even on my, on my swing here in that still position, my body is straight and I'm thinking to swing like a lever. I'm trying not to lose energy in my swing. And I think I was able to execute that very often in, in the jump that I took, which helped me connect with my pole. So I know we're not all at this point in our lives, but it's always good to hopefully work towards this position. And as you can see, these are $50 rings that I got from Rogue online. And what I did as we watch it again, um, I put elastic band in between. So it will hit me in my shin bones and it will stop me from going over and doing a flip. So I know that I can hit it hard and not have to try to force me stopping it vertical, which is so great for those young athletes because sometimes they might not know where they are in space and time, but that's kind of their safety net. So I'll run it again real quick and just kind of show you how the action happens and how it's kind of a safety. So as I tap, that kind of stops me at the top or a little bit past vertical. And once the kids get brave enough to actually swing and be aggressive, it's such a great position to be in because kids are, what I find in my club, kids get a little bit nervous to let their hips just go or to let the feet come up over the head, get in that position, that awkward position of being upside down. And so we try to do a lot of drills that get the kids upside down, get them heavy on their shoulders, get their hips above their shoulders. Um, above their shoulders as well. So like I said, you don't have to be a gymnast to be a pole vaulter and I want you to remember that. But just because you're not a gymnast doesn't mean you need to stay away from it. I think the more times you can play, whether you have a gym or not, um, it's only going to help you in, in the long run. 
Um, you only need to pick and select the elements that would be useful for the pole vault. I don't do back flips. I don't do back tucks. I wish I could, but I don't. And it doesn't really help me become a pole vaulter. I think the aerial component, if you do it, if you're a gymnast and you like doing it, go ahead, do it. Because I think the more times you expose yourself to being upside down in relation to, you know, space and time, it's only going to help you become more aware of where you are in, in, in on a pole vault uh, jump and try to connect. By learning and doing gymnastics uh, drills, which we'll talk about the bars, the ring, and the rope, athletes will gain an understanding of timing and energy needed to execute a well-timed vault. So even when I'm training kids at the club, we'll warm up, we'll get on the pit, and if the kid is struggling how to move a pole, I call them activation drills. I'll have my rope out, I'll have the rings, um, I'll have the bar accessible, and there's certain drills that I really like to go say, hey, you need to go do a tabletop, or hey, you need to go do a boot car really quick and try to activate and then come back and join us on the runway again. And sometimes that really helps them connect the dots. And so one of our coaches will go over, assist that athlete off the runway and kind of talk them through what they're trying to execute on the pit. So that really helps um, during, during a training session. Um, by opening your shoulders and creating a smooth arc, the athlete will keep a strong kinetic chain. So what's that? We're going back to that video that I showed you of, of me jumping and we'll get to an athlete that doesn't quite stay tight. And just remember by keeping that straight arch, that rigid body, you're gonna keep the energy flowing through the body. Once you break that chain, the energy slows down and you lose a lot of energy. So if a coach is telling you to get to the top of the pole quicker, that means you probably need to learn to be a little bit tighter through your swing. Um, if, yeah, if an athlete is too rigid or lacks that flexibility, the energy would be lost in the swing, um, in the turn and the overall jump. So it won't be as tight and um, precise as you had hoped. But if you can be a little bit tighter and know where you are in space and time, the energy will flow a lot. So now we're going to just go in through a bunch of um, uh, videos and I'll kind of talk through the videos that I picked that I thought would be really good for this presentation. Um, I kind of started with the easiest drills going into the harder drills. I, I call some of them my strength moves. Not all the kids can do them, but we all try, all try to do them with, with assisted um, help by a coach or another, another um, athlete in the club. So right here, this one I call it chest in, chest out. We're just really trying to create that dynamic swing. And we're just on a straight bar. And the good thing about this, you can go find a straight bar at a park. Hopefully you guys have a bar above your squat rack in your gym sometimes. And this just activates the shoulder. It gets the body moving in the direction we hope to swing um, when, when we're on a pole. The next one here is called a tabletop. So before I start this, this video, Steven's going to swing. And what I'm looking for is that his shoulders don't pass the upright bar. He needs to come through, open up, arch for me, and then he's going to redirect through his hands and he's going to lever at his shoulder. So he's going to go parallel to the ground. If he hits it right, oh shoot, where did I go? Sorry. <laughs> Tabletop, okay. Bear with me. Okay, so he's going to get a little bit of a swing. And then he's stretched. You can see that arch and then tabletop. He's going to squeeze his body tight. His glutes are tight. And as he comes through, he's opening and then pushing the bar back. So we can watch that again. So if you watch him, he should, if he does it right, that his shoulder shouldn't pass that upright. He stretches and taps. Arch to the hollow is basically what it is. So if we have gymnasts out there, the arch to hollow is a huge keyword for gymnasts out there. Sometimes I say chest in, chest out, but I, I, you know, when my gymnasts come in, I'm like, what does the gymnastics coach say? Cause I want to be able to talk your language as well. Okay. The next one, um, swing to invert. So we're basically creating that same swing, creating that tap, and instead of just going to tabletop to parallel, he's going to try to go all the way to the top, trying to get his hips up to his hands. So we'll watch it again. A little bit of a swing. It doesn't have to be a huge swing. And I, re I really like not having a big swing because I want the kid to understand to generate the stretch and then the fire back out. 
So if you can create that without having a big tap swing, you really understand how to come in, hit a takeoff, feel that stretch, and then move your hands back out at takeoff. And that's where the trail leg starts swinging through. Probably all our pole vaulters do some type of bupka. This is a static bupka. This is um, a little bit um, more of a challenge for our younger athletes. So both legs are on the outside of the bar. He's coming down into that bucket position that a lot of us get stuck in and he's trying to move out of it. Try to go down to the shoelaces. Try to loop this, but I didn't want to. Um, go down to the shoelaces and then extend up. So obviously we need to find balance on this bar. This is not an easy task, but a coach can come in there, hold the small of the back, grab the shoulder and help the athlete raise the hips, drop the shoulders and create that straight line. So if you're doing this with an athlete, those, those are the types of cues I, I would give you is to grab the small of the back and grab the shoulder, drive the shoulder down and assist those hips to go up. Cause there's a sticking point in there for a lot of the young vaulters. We do this a lot with our young vaulters. It's a split leg boot cut. And probably a lot of you do this one, but I really like this. And I try not to assist when the kids are doing this because I want them to get stuck and I want them to fight to get out of the bucket. So Steven can do it pretty good without touching his legs to the bar, but I see a lot of my young athletes assist themselves by touching their shin or dr dragging it up their leg. Um, and if you get good at it, you shouldn't be able to, shouldn't have to touch the bar with either leg. It should happen simultaneously if you're centered and balanced underneath the bar. So split leg bootka is really good for your young vaulters. And again, they can do this pretty, pretty much on their own. So this is a part of our conditioning at the end of, end of a session. Um, here we are, we're going into some bar drills. Um, this one I call a chin up pullover. There's a more advanced drill that, you know, I got to do with Tim Mack and Dimitri Markov. I got to train with some pretty cool people. Um, Brad Walker, uh, Becky Holiday, you know, all the, all these great athletes. Um, but some of these athletes were better than others. I remember Tim Mack could do, a chin up pullover no touch is, is really what this is supposed to be, but not all my athletes can do it. So you're going to do a two step into the bar, try to get your chin up as high as you can by keeping your body behind the bar. So you're like a Superman flying into the bar. You have your energy behind you. And as you tap your trail leg, you'll be able to curl over the bar doing a pullover. And if you're really strong and fast and tap um, aggressively, you can, clear your hips freely without touching. And that's, that's, oops, sorry. That's a pretty advanced move. Sorry, okay. So a chin up and then a pullover. So if he was a little bit more dynamic, I should have yelled at him at practice, <laughs> really tap. He should have started a little bit further back so he could actually jump and have his hips behind him a little bit more and then tap the trail leg through. Um, but all in all, this is a great move for a lot of the athletes, a lot of young athletes and, and skilled athletes, just because anytime you can get your hips above your, your shoulders and you're rotating around something is gives you knowledge of where you should be in space and time, especially when you're on your pole. So we do sets of five. We all get in line and we go through, run, run up there, grab the bar, do our pullover, get back in line. And that's a great little circuit of, of drills. The next one is frog hands. So again, a lot of my athletes, even if I have them at camp, kids just aren't comfortable getting their hips above their shoulders. And I'm sure some of the coaches out there could vouch for that with me, or maybe I'm out here in Idaho all by myself. But um, kids just have a really hard time getting to that uncomfortable position. And it seems really silly that I'm trying to get my, my fanny in the air, but guess what? That's what pole vault is. You want to cover the pole so you can maximize the energy in the pole. And if you don't match up with your pole, you're losing a lot of energy. So the more time you practice getting your hips above your shoulders, getting in line with your pole or the rope or the rings, probably you'll have much more opportunities to cover, cover the pole when you, when you take your jumps. So this is, you're holding on to a high bar, you do a little bit of a tap swing and you really go big straddle and Steven could raise his hips up a little bit higher, but he is giving me a really good tap swing. And on this last one here, I do feel like his hips are a little bit higher than, 
than his shoulders. Could he roll back even further? Yes, then I would give him an A+. Plus. So he's still learning. This, this is a guy that never did gymnastics, so I have to give him kudos for coming in and, and filming for me. So um, I appreciate it. The next one is double leg e eagles. And this is just working on hip flex strength, core strength, shoulder strength. Anytime we're hanging from a bar, we're working on all this kinetic chain, right? Um, this is a little bit easier maneuver than your typical eagle. Someone's holding a PVC out in front of him about hip level. And I'm just asking him to right, uh, raise his feet up and over that PVC. And then once he gets a little stronger, yes, we'll try to go a little bit so double leg eagles here again trying to raise those hips up curl up it's pretty strong it's a pretty good low core low ab workout um, and you're working on your strength being up on a bar so these drills are really great to implement into training and again you can do this at a park if you when once things start opening up hopefully we'll be able to get out and start being out and about a little bit more Park, get in there do a couple sets it's great for your shoulders, it's great for your hands, it's great for your low core, it's great for your hip flexors. Okay, gymnastics can help with body awareness while in there. I think we kind of talked on that, right? Um, it promotes strength and upper body, especially for female uh, athletes, just like I said. Um, I was very fortunate to use a lot of gymnastics training um, and I think I excelled in the pole vault because I grew up probably on a ranch, putting hay in the barn, pulling 2,000 pound steers around my property, getting them ready for fair. There, there were elements that I were surrounded with that kind of made me um, naturally strong. But there's a lot of kids out there that don't don't have that, right, in their background. A lot of girl, you know, a lot of kids aren't gymnasts. But if you can get in and strengthen your upper body by doing push-ups and handstands and, and things like that and rolling around, even in the grass out in your yard, you're going to get a little bit stronger and why wouldn't we try to get a little bit stronger just to get that much better in our pole vault i surely would and so for me i, I just really love teaching the gymnastics part and i know some of you coaches out there probably feel terrified about doing gymnastics but a lot of this isn't gymnastics right we're not tumbling um, we're not having to be perfect it's just getting out there and really trying to maximize what we can do with with limited space um, and this could be done in a really timely manner as well so, and at the end here, it, gymnastics, I really feel it helps with the rhythm and timing of, of the swing of the jump. Um, once you run down the runway, we work, you don't wanna lose that runway velocity in your takeoff. It, it should happen simultaneously. It should be effortless as you come in, you have an impulse off the ground and you're swinging. The swing should be just as fast as your run. You should be aggressive to the top. If you come in there and hit, and then you have to tuck and get it in a bucket, you just you just ruined your um, chances to jump a lot higher. So by doing some kind of gymnastics, learning how to keep a rigid body, you're gonna keep a lot of energy in your body, store it for the time that you need it. So going into rings, um, again, like I said, Rings are super cheap. You can hang them in a tree in your yard. You can hang them off a high bar like we did and you can get a lot of work done. So first and foremost, I'm really shocked that I'll get athletes up here and just try to hold a stability hold and they can't hold it. And it's all those little muscles that are in and around our shoulder and our lats that don't get utilized. We always work um, and the energy, us or we, we usually uh, recruit the bigger muscles before the little muscles. So this is a great little activity um, to do for all those little muscles that don't get utilized. And it will really show that you're not in tune with your body because you will just be shaking all over the place. So just doing some stability holds could help strengthen your overall shoulder girdle. The next one is an L support. I just add a little element of, um, um, you know, a little bit of a challenge here. We're working on the hip flexors again. We're working on that low core. We're working on that stability of the shoulder. We'll time kids for 15, 20, 30 seconds and see if we can hold it um, and, just, and just keep challenging ourselves throughout the year. So again, it's recruiting all those little muscles to, to fire. And so when we go do pole vault, we are strong to our shoulders. The next one is, is a tuck up. Um, 
You can do this on a ring. You can do this on rings. You can do this on a steel bar, kind of like the froggy we showed you on the steel bar. But and he does a really good job of getting his hips above his shoulders on this one here for me. Um, we're, that we're always working on that tap at takeoff, a little bit stretch, a little bit of that C position, creating that energy. And I think the more times you tap into that C position, you're going to understand how to create it on the runway. Um, and when we keep talking about it, I want to see that C position. I remember one of the cues my coach gave me is that he goes, Stacy, I'm going to stand on the back of the runway and I want to see what's on the sole of your shoe. I want you to run off the ground really strong, push off the ground, and then whip that trail leg to the top. And for me doing gymnastics and then hearing that from my coach when I was on the runway, it, it brought things together for me. And, um, you know, one of my my strength is is my swing and like i said i wasn't a gymnast i really enjoyed going to the gym once i started pole vaulting and these were those elements that i think helped me excel swinging on the pole so well skin the cat is it is a strength move um i had a couple girls in here um at my facility right before we all had to have lockdown and two of the girls were terrified to get in this position they didn't want to have their hips above their shoulders. They didn't want to be exposed. I don't know if they felt like they felt they looked funny, but I just wanted them to get upside down, feel that pressure in their shoulders because you want to be in that position when you're on a pole. And if you have a bent pole and you have ran down the runway and you've loaded your pole and you can get upside down and time up your jump, there's so much energy stored in the pole to then um, have a great push off off the top. So um, again, anytime that you can get upside down and even just hang out there for a little bit is, is amazing. And it seems really silly, but it's, it's so important for these young athletes. So Steven's going through skin the cat. Sometimes we'll come down to an L position and really use our strength to pull ourselves back through. But again, just getting our hips above our shoulders, going down, getting a nice stretch in our shoulders, a little bit of our lats, engaging everything in that shoulder area. Is, is really important. So if we go back to the beginning of, of the presentation, you saw my challenge to the coaches. I swung on the rings. I want you to kind of remember what my body looked like. I was pretty straight. There was a lot of energy going to the top. Um, Steven does a really great job, but he breaks a little bit at the hip. Not bad. I, I wish I had another video of a younger athlete really breaking and showing how slow he or she is now getting to the top and how super important it is to understand to keep that arc in your body and that, that rigidity so you don't lose the energy in your swing. So Steven's going to swing and he also gives me a little bit of a quarter turn at the top. So he kind of flicks his feet in the back. We've been working on that with him. He's been doing this for a while, but you know, like I said, he's not a gymnast by any means. Um, we'll watch it again. And, and I've learned how to move the rings properly. You're supposed to push them, you know, to a Y and then push them back, really create energy. And he's still trying to figure that out. But as you can see, in the swing, he's, he's um, buckling just a little bit. He's losing that kinetic chain and he's a little bit slower to the top than, than I. And so again, just work on tabletop swings, finding that rigidity in your body, and then trying to go to that inversion position. Again, you're gonna have so much speed in that pole. You might have to go up one or two poles. Your coach will be like, what just happened to you? Um, so that could be an exciting thing for you. Okay, we did, we did swings to invert on that one. That's okay. Here's a strength move. Just real obvious doing pull-ups we do pull-ups to gain lat strength shoulder strength right so this is just another challenge super easy again you purchase rings um this is something to add to your training i think we got pull-ups twice sorry All right well, maybe i lost it okay then we have dips this one's a little bit hard, it's sometimes hard to control those rings, but again, um, do it in a safe manner, put the rings down really low. And if you feel like you're unstable, you, the ground is right there. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't get hurt, but like, like doing dips on a steel bar, make sure your elbows are behind you. And again, this is just really activating all those little muscles that get overlooked because the big muscles override those little guys. So again, 
creating that really stable shoulder girdle is super important. Hey, you guys want to say hi? <laughs> she doesn't know I'm online. You want to say hi real quick? Hi. Okay. All right. Anyway. An ant bit you. An ant bit you. Okay. What do I do with an ant? <laughs> Help me, people. I don't know what an ant. <laughs> an ant bit me like two weeks ago, and I it hurt. I know. Okay, I'm online. Can can you go? Thanks. Take Rudy with you. <laughs> I knew it would happen. I knew it. Sorry. Be a mom. Okay. I think we're getting close to the end of the ring drills. Um, front levers, back levers. These are hard. I remember trying to do these with my coach, Dave, um, and he always showed me up. But this, again, puts you in a, a position of being really rigid and trying to control your body coming down. That's really hard on the back side. Let's see if um, I'll do it again. You really want to squeeze your tush, everything, so you can you can go to that parallel position. That's that's a hard one. He hasn't trained for it, so he's probably he's like, man, I got to train for that one. Okay. Some of the movements in gymnastics have the same feeling that you would have on the pole. Like I said earlier, for kids to get off the runway if they're they're struggling a little bit. Having some of these activation areas in and around your gym or out at your track are super helpful. Um, it's, it's so nice to take a kid over to a high bar and put them in a position to create that chest in, chest out feeling. Say, I want you to really open up through the shoulders. That's what we're trying to get you to. I don't want you pulling on the pole. So to be able to get off the runway sometimes and, and do some activation is, is, is super key and it, and it turns on light bulbs for these kids. Um, like I said, the run-up is the most important element that we train. We've had some great coaches come on and talk about the run and the importance and pole drop. Um, but if you can add some of that train, the gymnastics training to your preparation, you're less likely to lose energy. So why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you use it? Um, we typically do it on our, the day in the middle of the week. Wednesday is kind of a recovery day. We try to get off our legs on Wednesday and we focus more on our upper body. Like you saw in all these activities that we did on the rings rope and high bar, we weren't running. It was, we did a warm up obviously before we went in, but um, we keep, we try to stay off our legs that day. And we really emphasize working on our upper body, our shoulders, our core and all of that. So that gives you kind of that, that regulated day to kind of have a break on those legs and work on another element of your jump. So in the end, gymnastics will help you connect better on the pole and the, the, the speed of the swing should match the run of your jump. So don't forget that. We want to work on a run, but we also want to work on that swing. Um, and if you can add a little bit of gymnastics training in there, I think you're going to really um, benefit from it. Um, so we go into the to the rope drills now. I just have a couple of them. Standing to invert. Um, you can have a rope. Doesn't have to be super high, just a little bit, but if you can get inverted and try to get your hips to your hands and stay on that pole. Again, kids aren't comfortable getting their hips above their shoulders. Um, if you can do a series of standing to invert drills, those are always great. Um, one of my athletes here, I, I can't remember who I stole this to. I got to give a shout out. I can't remember if it was one of the Texas clubs, but I saw it and I stole it. So <laughs> I like it. Um, oops, wait a minute. I jumped ahead. I got to find Delaney. Ah, okay. Uh-oh. <laughs> it's not what I want. I'm not sure. Hold on. Bear with me. Might not show. Okay, so I'll just go back to the... It might not have uploaded properly. We've been playing around with this. I apologize. So um, basically about three feet from where she, um, where the rope hangs um, straight, there's a small box and she's gonna take two steps back and then she's gonna run towards the box, take two steps and then pun punch off of the box, off of her jump leg, try to reach up as high as she can to reach the rope and then she's swinging out over that purple mat and swinging to connect on, on the rope. It's, it's a really dynamic exercise. Um, the kids were a little bit reluctant to do it at first, but once they started doing it and really feeling that tap swing, they loved it. They wanted to do it every day before they, they got on the runway. So this is a, re a really great way to, to activate before you get on the runway. I know not everybody has a rope um, to be able to do this um, 
and you do want to make sure that you have mats underneath you in case something goes wrong you know safety first obviously but um the kids really like this and you can see her side down her hips are really close to her top hand and she's keeping good pressure um and staying back on on the rope this one is a little bit challenging again trying to really get heavy on your shoulders um getting your hips above your shoulders again um, it's called a two hand climb in and you're inverted Let's see if it plays okay so you pop the hips and then you grab and Jeremy has to really work on bending his knees, keeping his hips above his shoulders. Again, a lot of kids aren't comfortable just getting in this position. So if you could first work towards getting to this position and then by him compressing his knees and extending up with his hips, he can then reach and grab the rope, compress, reach and grab. So it, this one's a little bit more um, of a challenge for those younger athletes. These athletes have been with me for four years. So we've been trying this and doing this for four years and they've they've executed it quite well it's the same one um okay so from the ground another kind of strength move you can sit on the ground from a seated position and then try to pick yourself up get your hips to your hands by being pretty dynamic um again not all kids can do this right away you might have to help them grab the of their back grab their shoulder and uh mold them and help them assist their hips to get up um, to their hands. But um, another great one for a strength move for these for these athletes. Okay, so that's kind of like the presentation and all the gymnastics that I had for you. There's tons more, and I'm sure there's stuff out there that other uh, coaches have that I would love to see at some point. But um, I try to go through all my books and pick the ones that we use kind of on a regular basis. Um, like I said, that Wednesday day is, is earmarked for gymnastics. We're in the gym probably for two hours going through all those series and depending on the time of the year, depending, you know, it, there's reps for different things at different times. And so I, I try not to kill them, but I try to get, get in there and, and have a really good series of, um, drills in there for them and exercises. And so some people want to know what I'm doing now as I'm a retired Olympian, um, I own my own gym here in Boise, Idaho. I run camps and clinics, and I've also been working on a nonprofit called Try Something New. So this is me at a school, doing a school uh, a track fun day, and we had all the kids out there doing stick jumping. And some of you have followed my stick jumping program. It's been super fun. Um, and we just wanted to share a little bit of what we're doing and where we've been in this sh short period of five years. Um, a lot of learning. But it's sure been a lot of fun sh showing the young kids how to plan a bamboo pole and to move through space and time. So here we had a, two bamboo sticks or three bamboo sticks set up as, as um, um, the standards. And we were showing the kids that, gosh, some of you can jump over that. We've helped them get over it. And then you can see over in the left hand of your sque screen, there's a pole. Uh, a girl is holding a pole and there's another girl or boy holding a pole on the other side and it shows how high I actually jump. So the kids are like, whoa. And I said, maybe one day you can, you can jump that high as well. So they all had fun on this field day um, in California. So this next screen obviously shows you, um, it really shows you how high I've actually jumped. So sometimes I even look at it and go, man, I jumped pretty high back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like I said, stick jumping, um, a lot of people are asking, what is stick jumping? And so this all really came about. Um, I remember sitting around at one of my camps. Um, all the kids went to bed, the coaches get together. We talk about the day. We talk about what's gonna be happening in the days to come. And we all love vaulting, right? That's why you guys are watching tonight. And you wanna, you wanna learn more, you want to help out more, you know, whether you're a parent or a retired person watching. Um, but we really felt like we really needed to reach out to the grassroots to get kids excited about pole vaulting. At first we thought we're going to go find our next Olympic champion. We're going to handpick kids. And once we started going around the country, um, with these bamboo sticks, it, it was eye opening for me. Um, I went to schools where kids were sitting on the sidelines, not participating. And that really, that really bugged me. I, I went to school to be a PE health educator and to see kids in PE not participating in something really fun 
of just playing and being a kid and kids were sitting on the sideline basically saying, well, Johnny's got the football and he doesn't, he doesn't include me really, really hurt me. And then you see other PE teachers that are super organized and they get everybody up and playing. And so, you know, kudos to all those teachers. I know it's super hard, but what we've done is we really try to earmark going into schools where we know that there's super excited teachers that want something new for their program. And what we've, um, come up with is stick jumping curriculum. And um, you can see in some of these photos that you know, I have Olympic gold medalist Tim Mack right there in the middle, um, which is super fun. We went all the way out to Knoxville, Tennessee and got his whole club um, involved in it one day. Um, we've been all over the country. Um, it's a nonprofit. And so I'll, I'll explain a little bit more as, as I go into this, but this is one of the slides that that I, I really like showing. Um, it's, you know, embrace the power of failing up and fail, failure is an opportunity to explore and to challenge and to improve uh, my learning and skill. And so for pole vaulters, you have three attempts to make a bar, right? And if you don't, if you don't make it or say I set a world record and then I ch chose to go for another height because I feel pretty good and then I don't make it, kind of feels like I'm failing, right? But you turn around, you can think about, well, what could I have done better to make that jump better, right? Or these kids in these schools, if they um, afraid to, to explore and to challenge themselves, they'll never know what's really out there. So really the message for, for us when we go out to these schools is to get these kids to try something new, to, to not be afraid to fail in front of their peers. You know, some kids will take the pole and run with it. Other kids need a little bit of guidance. But um, all in all, once we've gone out to schools, it's been really fun to see all the kids participate because it's something new, it's something different. It's not a football, it's not a basketball, which we're so used to here in America. It's a bamboo stick that's super inexpensive to have and the kids can have so much joy on it. So um, when we go out to schools, I really, preached to, to, to not be afraid to go out there and fail at something and to if you fall down on your bum just get back up keep going and we'll come out there and, and help guide you so this is pretty staggering in a short time of five years um from 2015 to 2020 we've been able to reach out to 44,000 kids and you can see where the united states where we've been and even across the pond to ireland um, and england um, we've been to 112 schools um, in 20 states total. So pretty amazing, four countries. Um, and teachers want it, they want something different. And so Steve and I aren't, made, aren't afraid to make phone calls. People watch us, we post things on Instagram and Facebook and, and teachers literally reach out to us because they want something different for their kids. They're sick of rolling out the football and the basketball and, and they want to try something different. And for us, we're happy because we're pole vaulters. And maybe we think, you know what, one of these kids will become a pole vaulter. And if they don't, we've exposed them to something pretty cool, right? And we feel pretty good about it. Um, I love showing some of these clips, kiddos playing, and some of them have some really great skill sets. First, picking up a stick, a little bamboo stick, um, and playing. Oh, I'm not sure where that one went. This is us taping poles at my house. Okay, so there's a middle schooler um, using the stick for the first time. These are middle schoolers. These are middle schoolers going through some mini hurdles, some wickets working on their high knees. And then we tell them to jam and jump into the hula hoop. That's their target. And they really pick it up pretty quickly. Here's another kid, a young seven year old, I believe. Um, just picked it up for the first day at a little school um, demonstration. Um, and then we have Becky Holiday in there and Becky's been one of our ambassadors too. So it's been super fun to go around the country. These kids learn how to do a straight pole drill really quickly and they want more. We've done things off of uh, platforms where they'll swing into the sand. Some schools are outfitted with more, with more equipment like landing pads and we'll be able to swing them to their backs and that's super fun and they get a big thrill out of that. And then they want to know where they can get more of it, which sometimes ties into these great clubs that we have all across the country. Um, so some of the sample activities that I just showed you, it starts with an expert demonstrating the video of um, basic biomechanic movements. 
that form the fundamental underlinings of pole vaulting. So we don't really say we're pole vaulting, right? Because we don't really expose them to their backs um, unless they have proper equipment. And this is a shout out to, to Dave Butler. I know that's watching. He's given us so much information. He's gone out to schools all over the place and collected so much data and just um, the art of playing really is what he's done. Balancing a pole on kids' hands, um, um, doing different drills. And so we've taken some of the things that, that he's used and implemented into our program. So thank you, David Butler, for helping us out. Again, this is one of Dave Butler's athletes. Um, and I think we stole one of these drills too. It's one of his probably collegiate athletes. I'm not exactly sure who it is, but he sent the video. And he actually used a hula hoop as well for the target. So his athlete's gonna work on a nice takeoff and a turn and um, the target is the hula hoop to try to land in. So what we tell our kids is to jam the tip into the hula hoop and jump. So it's jamming and jumping is one of our activities. And this guy here clearly did one of our drills. And then we got a younger kid. Um, I think this is our seven, yep, our seven year old. A little pole vault practice, he wanted to play and we put a little hula hoop out there. He had a nice impulse off the ground. Look at that drive knee, knee up, toe up. And guess what? I don't know if some of you know who that guy is on the left-hand side, I'll have to go back. But um, Sergey Bubka, our former world record holder, has a book out and the book cover is him as a little boy taking his first jump. So this could potentially be our next world record holder. We don't even know. So pretty exciting stuff. These kids get a big kick out of it. And there's Sergey showing, he's got a nice knee up. I think this boy actually had a better knee up, toe up than Sergey did. I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna say. Okay, oh, there we go again. So pretty good, pretty good positions here for first time flyers, right? Then we got a, another young girl, first day. This was over in England. Steve was over in England um, a year ago. And this girl learned how to move the pole really quick and luckily we had a nice big sand pit for her to swing in but she ran down there punched her hands up real aggressively and guess what that pole moved to vertical like nobody's business she didn't pull on it she punched it really tall and that that impulse off the ground helped uh move that stick so guess what she probably needs a, a bigger stick now not a problem not a bad problem to have so here um, we're in Colorado, uh, Pat Manson and Amy Manson came out to join us and we're in some of the schools, I think about, this was probably our first year or second year out. They had some really great landing mats, obviously. So we were able to get the kids to swing to their back. Um, and we got a little little one here. I think he's a little, little, um, a little preschool kid just learning how to coordinate using those sticks. And to, um, I think that's another David Butler's drill of using the sticks to get him up high, almost like an A-frame and to swing to swing through. He was having a fun time. He wouldn't come back around to us. He just kept going down the field. So we knew he, he was having a good time. Here's two um, middle school girls helping out another younger girl to learn how to get her hands up really high and to swing. Sorry, these videos are crashing together. Um, Slow down, Stacy. Okay, so here she comes. Okay, so she's quite a bit younger than these two older girls and they had her hold really high and she's gonna take a step, give us a good knee position, right? They're teaching her, I love it. I love seeing these young athletes teach, even the younger kids and she goes right to her bum and she's safe and she gets the high five and she's loving it. So she's gonna come up back for more. So there's different elements along the way. Obviously we start on the ground first and then we can get them up to a platform position. This school here, they basically just turned out the whole, the whole school to us. We had like 400 kids out on a field. We're like, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do with 400 kids at, at one time? So we created a stick relay race. And so we got all the kids, three, four, five kids on a stick and they charged the field and they were loving it. <laughs> We're like, what do we do with all these kids? We can't quite teach pole vault, but they could sure have fun on a broomstick, right? So a lot of the younger kids, you know, we found your 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 kindergartners, your first graders don't quite have the upper body strength to hold on with their sticks, but we can still do a lot of different circuits and um, and and free play like this and and challenges between teams, and they have a lot of fun getting exercise and doing something different. 
So the challenge we're, we're facing um, is how to continue to teach and to mentor and to spread the knowledge and interest in pole vaulting um, in the age of the, co uh, the coronavirus. Just today, uh, Steve Thomas and I, my co-founder, um, we were on a virtual um, uh, uh, conference, just like we are right now. Um, we called into a school that really wanted stick jumping to come um, these last couple weeks, and unfortunately, we were all stuck at home. So she's been teaching on Zoom to all her kids, and their their unit this week was to pick a hero, and she had books to pick heroes from, but she also knew that Steve knew me, and so um, they wanted to Skype in with me and to talk to me about um, what, what I have done and what I've accomplished, and so it was really fun to get in and to, um, to talk with the kids. But in the fall, Steve was actually in there doing um, a class. So all the kids got to do the stick jumping program. And now they got to actually hear from me, um, the, um, the mentor and the teacher. So I can get online with these kids, with the teachers and help them execute the next drill or the next skill set. And then also tell them or talk to them a little bit about um, the history of the pole vault, what I've accomplished in the pole vault, and also bring on other other um, celebrities of of our sport, um, you know Sam Kendricks and Sandy Morris and Katarina and Becky Holiday and so many others have been such great ambassadors for us. We've had them Skype all over the world um, in between their training days, and we super appreciate it. The kids love it, love having this face to face conversation. <coughs> Excuse me, and um, and just hearing a little bit about uh, what it takes to be an Olympian and um, so. So as we're kind of stuck and we don't know what the future is going to hold, Steve and I have been trying to create these opportunities to go online and to have these face-to-face -face conversations with the kids. They can go out in their yard and do some activities, but then they also come back into their classroom <coughs> and learn and learn some of the skills. And so that's been super fun and that's what we worked on today. Um, earlier this year, <clears throat> with um, Steve being over in Europe, we were able to do a remote clinic and seminar. I was a little bit or nervous. I guess it was 2009. This was right before 2020. He was over in um, in England, and he called me and said, hey, just went and spoke with this, this club. They would really love for you to get on Skype and help them with some of their training. And I thought, wow, how's this going to go? But it was super fun. They Skyped me in. <coughs> Sorry. And we basically went through a warm up session with them. We went through their running mechanics and I corrected them as we went. The kids were able to come over to the camera. I was able to talk to them. Uh, later in, I think later in the day, they actually got on the pit and, and I didn't, um, I saw some of that, but not all of it. But the biggest thing was just working on their, their sprint mechanics and carrying a pole and learning how to run a little bit more efficiently. And so that was super fun and, you know, all from the home, my, my home here in, in Meridian, Idaho. So there's, there's tons of things that we can do out there now that, you know, uh, Joel has created this, this opportunity for us to get on Zoom and to really interact with everybody. Um, so like I said, the, our nonprofit is called Try Something New. Um, Sandy, we talked to Sandy earlier this week. She's on board to help us do these online lessons. And I know that if I reach out to some of the other Olympians, they'll be great enough to come out and help us. And so I just want to thank you. I know some of you are probably watching. Some of you have participated with us and it's been a, it's been a home run for us. And for these kids to be able to dream a little bit, to maybe think that they could be like you or, you know, one day compete on the level that you do is, is something that all these kids need to know and, and to be inspired by. And then some of the kids, I want to give a shout out to the kids that have been on my, my Boston trip. Um, they've gone out to do the stick jumping with us in Boston. Um, some of the kids were really nervous to go out there and teach the little kids. But once they got out there in their element, it was so easy and so natural for them to teach these little kids how to move on a little bamboo pole. And you could just see the joy in their face when they got back in the van and we went back to our house and just talking about, you know, how it was really fun for them to be able to give back, you know, to a sport that's given them so much as well. So... Um, it's, it's something that we really enjoyed and we hope that it continues to grow. So these are some of the boards that have gone on, um, online. We've talked about some of our heroes There's Sandy, there's, uh, Mondo, there's some of the history of, of, of stick jumping. Um, 
and, and where bamboo literally comes from. Remember, bamboo is grass, it's not wood. <laughs> so um, I know I run camps and I know there's a lot of coaches that are out there wondering what we're gonna do for this summer with the camp series. Um, but what, what, I, what my feeling is, is that we just need to go to smaller camps. There's kids calling me every day, are we gonna be able to have camp this summer? And I wanna be able to say, yes, we can but I wanna be able to do it in a safe manner. So um, the smartest thing that I think that we can do or think about right now is just be in smaller in size. Um, I might be able to run a couple more camps now that I have my indoor facility and outdoor facility up and running. Um, so just check websites for camps and clinics. I know you guys are itching to get back at it. Um, there's a lot of clubs that have camps. There's a lot of you know coaches that run camps. So make sure you get on the websites and, and check things out for camps. Just know that things are probably going to be a little bit smaller um, so we can make sure that we adhere to um, the, the guidelines that we need to adhere to. But I think this will just keep it safer um, and, and everybody uh, a lot safer. And if you're interested, if there's any teachers out there or coaches that know that there's teachers out there that want something different, here's our information. Um, this is kind of what I wanted to end with. Um, my camps, I didn't want to just solicit myself, but I do want to, there's so many great coaches out there that run camps and clinics. And so, um, like I said, just make sure you get out there, look online, we'll be posting everything really soon. I pretty much have my dates. Just give me a couple extra days um, to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to make sure it's, it's going to run safely. And any teachers are out there for stick jumping programs. If you know somebody that's one of those go-getter teachers, we want to be in that school. Um, and we want to get this uh, implement um, this, this program implemented as, as soon as possible. And we, we just don't know if we're gonna be invited to go literally into the schools, but if we can do the things online that we've done today with our demo school that we did in Benicia, it, it went over really fun. The kids were super entertained. Um, they were going a little bit crazy because they, they wanted they wanted to uh, ask so many questions. Um, we gave them a lot of information and they asked me some really great questions. And so it's a really great way to interact with some of these kiddos that are just starving for information. And I think that's it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Stacy. Um, I do have some questions that came in while you were presenting, so I want to make sure that I can um, address those questions for you. Um, are you okay if I take down the share screen? Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to do that quick, um, and that'll bring up the larger audience here. Um, and and Stacy, you'll kind of be highlighted here. Um, in answering these questions, but <clears throat> so one of the one of the questions that came uh, in was in taking a look at the the high bar drills, especially um, most of them uh, the athletes are moving with with double legs, and so I wanted to know your thoughts on single leg versus double leg swing, um, as many of those drills are double leg drills, but we oftentimes emphasize single leg in the pole vault. I know. Um, I, honestly, that's just the way I was taught. I was taught down in a gym, probably taught like a gymnast. Um, what I do find is when a kid does like a figure four position, I feel like the kids do get stuck in that position and they get stuck in a bucket. They break at the hips and then it's hard for them to shoot up. So I tend to like to do a lot of my drills with double leg. Um, there's times that we'll rock, we'll, we'll, we'll do a figure four position you know, we'll run to the bar and hold that figure four position, knee up, toe up at times. But for the most part, I want speed at off the ground. And I think when they learn to swing like a lever, um, it, it happens differently than it does in a figure four position. Perfect. Um, then many of the, uh, uh, there's a couple questions and, and they came in as you were talking about the, the gymnastics part and then you answered some of them, but I just want to clarify for the, the group um, a couple things. Um, you're primarily doing the gymnastics training on uh, the middle of the week on a, on a day that's not a jump day. Um, you may be using that as a, a cue to focus on a particular movement that maybe they're struggling with in a practice session, but... Uh, you're not really coupling both the gymnastics and an entire vault session together in one one time. No, um, not typically, just because it, it is taxing on the body. Um, I like to just really focus on the gymnastics 
Um, and whether it's, a, you know, some kids come in on Saturday and they have an option to come in and do gymnastics or they have an option to come in and jump. Some kids just come in and do their gymnastics training. Um, so I don't, I don't like to do a full session of gymnastics with, with pole vaulting. I, I might hear a couple activities that they need to go do to, to activate. I call it activation drills, but they're not spending an entire, you know, session. Um, they might run off, run off the pit, go do a couple drills. They get back on the pit or I'll go, you know, Hey, maybe go try the rope. Cause you're not getting it from the, the rings and, and different things, but we're not doing a whole session combined. And so then where does weight training fit in that um, program model that you have? So we, we train very similar to like what a college program would train. Um, when we jump, we run and we, lift. we, we load that day heavy and then we have a recovery, you know, a lighter day. So if the kids can stay and, and, and um, for sure do their running and then come in and, and stay and do their lifting. Um, like I said, Saturdays are some of those times kids need to go, you know, I can't control everything. I wish everybody could stay for the whole two and a half hours, three hours that we're down there. Some kids will come in and um, elect to do a little bit of gymnastics and then come in and get their weights in that they didn't get in during the week. Um, we'll start with three days of weightlifting and then we'll back off to two days during season. Okay. And so that's a question that also um, kind of comes into with when we had Tim Riley speak and, and uh, with clubs, like kind of how does that work with your club in terms of them jumping at their high school and your club and how do you facilitate or orchestrate that whole piece kind of for the coaches that are out there that might be in a similar situation or for athletes that might be in that similar situation. Right. Um, you know, I, some of my kids come in the fall, we start with the fall preparation, just like a college would, um, we run, we do tempo runs, things like that. Before we even get into pit, I like, I like to stay off the runway for a good month, month and a half. The kids are itching to go, of course, but I know that I need to hold the reins and just be athletes first. Um, um, just getting strong with different elements, a lot of med ball and running and introducing the weights and introducing the gymnastics and we'll carry the pole. We'll do grass vaults and sand vaults and things like that, but we're not on the pit for probably a good month, month and a half. And then we'll start out really slow, but getting back to club versus high school or, you know, uh, middle school, it really comes down to, for us here, it really comes down to what the head coach and if there is a pole vault coach, what they're willing to, to give up. Some of the coaches know that I have a, a good array of poles and their school is very limited or they don't have a pole vault coach or their, their coach is very limited. And if the kid has been training with me since the fall, a lot of those kids are able to come train with me at least during season, at least one day a week. And we'll save that long technical day for them to be with me. And then those kids can then give back to their program, teaching the younger kids is kind of how it works out for a lot of my older kids is that they're helping the younger kids. Uh, or if they have so many kids, some of our, some of our schools have 20 plus kids, like a lot of you. And so my, my seniors and juniors will go and take those newbies and run them through a program. So it's kind of their down day. And then they'll come and work with me on their technical day. So it just depends. Some, some schools allow their kids to come and train with me full time, or I might get them once, once a week type thing. Um, the question that I, I haven't asked any of the coaches yet and um, kind of came to my mind here just as we were here is like, what is the ideal number of athletes in a training session for you? Um, I try to limit my groups to about 10. Once you get past that, even when I trained, it's like you get off the runway, you, you converse with your coach, you talk about what you need to work on. You want to get right back on the runway and try to fix that, right? So once we get more than eight to 10 kids, th things get lost. And even when I, when we train and we do have that many kids, I'll have a slide box out. Like I said, I'll tell kids to go activate. So some of the kids are out doing other things to activate, to keep their mind on the skill that they need to work on. And then once they get back on the runway, they really haven't been sitting all that long. And, you know, once the kids get in the rhythm of being at, at club, we, we go pretty fast, especially my, my juniors and seniors. I do two sessions a night. My older, more advanced kids go first, and then my younger kids come in. And it's quite a difference of, of learning. I don't have to say a lot to my older kids. They know what they need to work on. Yeah, there's times I'll have to pull them off the runway, but for the most part, they're running pretty smooth and I just have to cue them a little bit. We'll watch a video. Sometimes I'll throw it up on my TV and then the next person goes. Um, 
my younger kids need a little bit more hands-on, right? They need a little, little bit more guidance. And usually I have two coaches working um, in the evening just to be able to pull kids off, let them know that we care about them, let, you know, get a little bit more hands-on with those kids. And so still keeping them to 10, 10 kids is really the ideal for me. Um, Perfect. Um, so if you're getting kids coming to your club and you're working with, um, you know, you're getting some newbies, you potentially, obviously you're going to get some new vaulters at your club. Uh, what are some of the things that you would, you like to focus on the most for those beginners? So it really comes down to stick jumping. Um, I have a lot of sticks in the gym. Um, they have a rubber tip on it. So they don't, they don't slip like a real pole. Like I'm not, I don't have grass right, right outside my gym. So we go grab the stick jumping sticks. They learn how to do straight poles across the turf. I put hula hoops out as well. Um, so we'll do walking plants. We'll go through the whole progression first. And then if I feel like they're ready to go and, and actually jog and plant, then, then we'll, we'll go into that lead up drill. And then I really like to get them on the pit that first session, just so they have that, that feeling and, and hopefully get them excited. As long as they're you know moving straight and they're not pulling on the pole, um, you know, we go through a pretty good progression to make sure that all the kids are safe. Um, we don't really in introduce the gymnastics that first time. Um, I do do an intro class. I, you know, I, I have an intro class that lasts for an hour and I get a lot of like sixth, seventh and eighth graders that come in. And so they spend a lot of time off the runway. Um, I wish that I could progress like Tim Riley, like getting on a bent pole right away. I, I called him afterwards and I asked him about how he does that. And, you know, he's pretty fortunate. He gets a lot of pretty talented kids. And um, I don't always get that super talented kid. So I have to make sure the kid is safe first. And so we start out with a lot of straight pole drills. Perfect. Um, so let's say, for example, you have a, an athlete coming in, uh, you worked with them, developed them, and now it's time for them to leave. Um, and they're going off to college and other things like that. Um, question came in uh, from one of the coaches on our, our panel here um, that talked about, you know, you, you started out with a coach and then you moved to a different coach. Um, and so what advice would you have for athletes that maybe are in a high school setting and now they're moving to a college setting or something like that? Like, how do you make a smooth transition through that process? And what are you looking for as an athlete um, in that search for a program right um well first i get really sad because i i lose my kids right we we get to work with kids for four years or plus and you put a lot of sweat equity into it you get to watch them grow as a vaulter and as a person and then then they blossom and they get to go on to a four-year school or you know um and and that's super exciting um <clears throat> first i tell the kids to cast a big net you know um I want, I want to know their dream schools. I want to try to help them out as much as I can, but I, I got to know what, what, where their heart is, what they want to study. Some schools don't have the majors that they're looking for. And if I can help them out by making a phone call, I do. Um, I really encourage my kids to make a YouTube video of some of their training, um, show their good ju jumps, show their bad jumps, show other aspects of their training, um, running hurdles, long jumping, um, show them you know, doing other activities. I, I coaches really want to know that the kid is a well-rounded athlete. Um, and I think that I, I excelled in the pole vault pretty quickly because I was well-rounded. I was a hurdler in high school. I ran the relays. I did long jumping. I did the heptathlon in college. I threw implements. So it, I think that helped me become a better pole vaulter sooner than later. Um, so I love helping the kids in this process, but it really comes down to what they want. And I'll try to steer them in the direction that I, that I think that would be a good fit for them coaching wise. I tell them to reach out to the coaches. And by doing those YouTube videos, I think it's really great for the athlete to send it out to the coach. So then the coach can see what the athlete is doing. And that makes it easier for the coach then to call that athlete and say, hey, I seen your jump. What are you working on here? And that makes conversation um, a lot easier instead of, looking at a piece of paper and going, well, you're five, seven, you're 135 pounds. Sounds like a pretty good body structure, but I don't know what you look like. And I think that helps break down that barrier really quick. So you can talk about a commonality. Um, and I've had a lot of kids be really successful that way by sending video. Um, I get kids that come home on break and they come and tell me what their new coach is telling them to do. And I have to be respectful of that. 
and I and sometimes it's very similar. I just say it a little bit differently, and sometimes it's completely different. And but I need to be respectful of what the coach and the athlete are working on, and sometimes that's a little bit hard because my philosophy might be a little bit different. Um, I didn't even talk about the bottom arm. It really wasn't a part of my my you know my my topic here, but. I don't believe on using the bottom arm in, you know, moving the pole. It, it's through the top arm. And so I get a lot of kids come home and say, my well, coach really wants me to have a straight bottom arm. And I was like, well, if you're taking off at 10, sometimes that's going to be a struggle, right? And you need a little bit more space to be able, especially for the girls to make that happen. Um, so there's times that I don't, you know, I'll, I'll call a coach and say, hey, you know, this is what you guys are working on. I totally get it. But you know, what do you want me to work on with the kid when they're home at Christmas? And so I try to bridge that gap. I try not to go against the grain, right? I know that they're going to be at that school for four years, five years, and you want everybody to have a successful, su successful time. Very good. Um, so kind of moving then to, um, you started out your presentation, you know, showing us some video of, of yourself and jumping. And, and one of the things that, you know, you were, uh, the pioneer for the women's pole vault um, here in the United States. And so I think we'd be remiss to ask, I would be remiss if I didn't ask for a story or two, if, if you had um, like your favorite competition, was it the Olympics? Um, was there some other event that you had that really um, meet stories? And, and then I'm going to couple that with a question, a part that Pat Manson talked about, like in, preparation for me. So like, what did I do as an athlete to prepare myself to be comfortable in a, in big meat settings where you obviously performed really well, uh, to get a gold medal? <clears throat> no, thanks. Um, well, before everybody got online, I, I told a funny one <clears throat> about after winning my, my medal in Sydney, um, it was really late at night and, um, it was after 12 o'clock and after you win, you go through press, you know, there's tons of outlets that are asking questions. So you could be there for an hour or longer talking to press, different press. And then you're whisked away to go do your urine sample. Um, so um, a lot of you know, we have to give urine samples. We want to make sure that we're above the board and that we're, we're competing clean. And so when I was out on the field for almost five hours, I was probably a little dehydrated. Even though I was taking sips of water, I didn't want a big slushy stomach. But I get up there and I can't produce a sample forever. And my, my manager is up there with me and his friend is up there waiting. And finally I produce a sample probably after an hour. So now it's like one, one thirty, And I'm, my manager's getting texts like, where are you? We want to celebrate, blah, blah, blah. We're just around the corner. And, you know, Peter says, we'll be there in just a minute. So we leave the, the drug testing uh, facility, come out, and we go through this corridor thinking we're going to get to the elevator to get downstairs to get out fast and we get to that corridor and the doors are locked they're chained sorry butler I already told this story to butler earlier <laughs> <laughs> so then we we walk the other way thinking okay we'll just turn around and go down this corridor and go through this door we get down there there's chains on the the bars there the you know the the doors are locked i'm like oh my gosh okay let's go down a floor so we go down a floor we're doing this for like 30 minutes going like a a puzzle in this massive stadium that holds 120,000 people. Literally, probably 30 minutes later, we're finally like, okay, let's go down this way. Probably can't get out, but we're gonna go down this way. I see light, I'm like, oh, there's light. There's lights down there. So we walk down this corridor, we get there. There's big doors open, we're like, yay. We get there and there's a big pile of garbage that's been collected from the stadium. And I was like, Oh my gosh, like I see a gate that's open that gets us out of this place, like let's go. <laughs> so we decided to pick up cardboard. I was the first one in line. I put down a piece of cardboard, step on it. Peter would throw one around. We just did this, you know, all the way to the top of the heap of this garbage. I mean, half eaten hot dogs and hamburgers and empty beer can, beer bottles, just smelled horrible, right? So we get to the peak of the mound and, you know, I'm like, I see it. We can get out for sure. We're going. All of a sudden I hear, ah, ah, and crash into this pile of garbage. And Peter's friend went down <laughs> <laughs> mustard and mayonnaise and ketchup everywhere. And I'm like, I don't care. Let's get out of here. So even, you know, even at the top of my game, I didn't have a red carpet rolled out. I had to climb over some garbage to get out to go celebrate with fam family and friends. That's a funny one. 
<laughs> on a more serious note, <clears throat> I remember I was with Greg, and this was after uh, trials in 2004. We were over in Ostrava, and it was a month before um, the games in 2004. And I'd already been in Europe for a couple weeks. Uh, we went to a couple meets, um, you know, have a couple days in between meets, then you fly to the next meet. So we're in Ostrava. And I remember warming up and starting the competition and I just feel flat. And so I walk over to Greg and I'm like, I don't think I have it today. And he's like, what do you mean you don't have it? I'm like, I feel like dog. <laughs> <laughs> and it's no fun to feel like that, especially when you got all the top competitors at a meet with you. And I'm like, how am I going to get out of this position? And, you know, he told me, he goes, just go work on this aspect of the jump and really try to execute this aspect. And so as the meet went on and the bar went up, I'm in, I'm still in. I'm like, I don't know how this is because I don't feel like I'm firing. I feel like I have to really work to get down the runway. I'm just, just feel like I'm flat. And so pretty soon it's just me in the competition. And I look at Greg and he's like, put it up at the world record. So we put it up at 483, which is 15, 10 and three quarters. And I was like, man, he's crazy. I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. You know, I, I didn't think I had it in me, but I just said, just work on <clears throat> for Greg is probably the takeoff, get my foot down, get my hands up. And then everything else takes, takes, <clears throat> just goes flowing after that. Right. And, um, I don't, I don't even remember what attempt I made it on. This is how crazy it is. So I don't make it on the first one. I know that. And we put the bar up again and I just kind of told myself, just get down the runway, get my hands up, you know, uh, make sure I have space and then just swing like a mother. And so I take off, I keep my top arm pressure, just driving, driving, driving to my thighs. I'm making the turn and I didn't hit the bar yet. I'm like, what's going on? And I just keep finishing the jump and I push off and I don't feel the bar yet. I'm like, what's going on? And I push off the pole and I still don't feel it. I was like, and I look up and it stayed. I'm like, what the heck just happened? So kudos to Greg. He, you know, told me to pull my head out when I needed to and I love telling it because <clears throat> some days you just don't feel it, right? I've, I've competed against people that have 103 temperature. They're not feeling it, but something just triggers in the body. Like I've done it so many times. Just relax, go down the runway, work on one aspect of the jump and things are gonna be okay, typically. I had a friend, Svetlona Feofanova, she was in bed. We were at London, one of the biggest meets um, of the season. And we heard that she had a fever and I thought, oh, she's not coming to the meet. You know, um, I'm not going to have this head to head competition with her. And man, here she comes out at the track and she's blowing up bars. I'm like, oh, my gosh, either she doesn't have a temperature or she's just rock solid. And so I talked to her afterwards and she said, I just I just had to do it, you know, and whatever that meant in Russian language, just had to do it. She just did it and give her, you know, give her kudos for that. But, you know, I've, I've known kids to be sick and not feeling awesome and they and they come out and, and they execute because they're not really thinking about it. They're they're thinking about something else or they just they just let their body take over because they've had so many repetitions down the runway. Instead of getting so worked up and tight about it, just just let it flow, right? Um <clears throat> now I forgot the second part of the question. Well, sorry. Uh so you kind of you kind of walked yourself right into the second part of the question, which was in those, you performed really well in big meets. And so what were some of the strategies that you had for performing well in big meets? And you kind of were walking right into that. Yeah, no, I love that when Pat talked about it, because it's so important for those young athletes. It's so important for the elite athletes to put themselves in big competitions, even meets they think they shouldn't be in, like get in them as much as you can. Because I think um, the more times you're in a situation you're not used to, you're, you're just ready for anything to be thrown at you. Um, one of the first European meets that I was in, we had to do a call room and the call room was tiny. It was probably 10 by 10 by eight. Like you could barely move around. And I just created my own space around me. I kept doing running drills to stay warm. I kept all my clothes on to keep my body warm. I didn't know how long we were going to be in the call room because they hold you sometimes. Then they'll come tell you the last information. They'll make sure you have your number on. They limit what you can take out to the field because they want it to look clean for for TV presentation. Um, and so we were just standing in there like cattle, not knowing, you know, when we can go out and start running again. So some people are freaking out sitting there going, well, I need to be doing this, this, and this. And so, um, 
there'd be times when I would be training at Idaho State and it would be snowing. And I'm like, oh, we're not jumping today. Dave goes, no, we're jumping. <laughs> I'm like, duh. <laughs> but you know what? I, I kept clothes on and I, and I trained through those times because you just don't know what's going to be thrown at you. Um, even in high school, I remember going to the state meet the first time in the 300 hurdle down in LA. And, you know, I'm not in familiar territory. Um, I'm literally the only white girl in the meet. And I was terrified. I thought these girls are going to eat me alive. And if I would have just went in and did what I knew I could do, I came in as the North Cal champion. And I went in, you know, and I, and I lost the race dead last because I let everything get in my head. And so by that time, I said, you know what, I can't let that happen. I got to get out there and compete. And, um, you know, Dave would do scenarios and practice with me too. I'd be jumping okay. And he's like, okay, this is the third attempt at such and such meet. What are you going to do? He put the bar up at whatever. He wouldn't even tell me what the bar would be at. And I'm like, okay, I better bring it. And so you just have to kind of focus right away and, and get in that frame of mind. Um, also, I think in Sydney, which was a huge um, – Thing for me is that um, in the winter, their winter is, is um, or our winter is their summer. So I was in the winter season and I had a couple meets at our home track. And then Dave said, I want you to go down um, in the winter to, um, to them in their summer season to jump a little bit, just to get that whole Australia thing off your mind, go do some things, go see some sites. So when you go down in Sydney, if we make the team, you're there to compete. And so I'm really thankful that he sent me down I was so excited to go and I'd never been to Australia. You know, I wanted to see all these animals that I've never seen and, and, and just compete and, and just have fun. And, and I'm glad that I did that early because when I went down for the games, it was, it was game on. I wanted to compete well. I wanted to do my very best. And so when I was there in training camp leading into going into Olympic Village, I was there to train with my coach, to go back, to do my rehab, and then just get ready for competition day. And then I had time on the end you know, we had time scheduled to stay later afterwards and, um, and play. So I think, especially for those high school kids, get in those big invites if you can, you know, be neck and neck with the kids that you think you shouldn't compete with because there were times, even at the elite level, I would just watch these other girls kick my butt, you know, Emma George was one of them. She, you know, she was the leader for so long. I would go to meets and I'm like, wow, her jump is pretty. Like she runs so well. Like she makes it so effortless and I would just sit and count myself. Well, she's here and, and Zella Bella Canova's here. I guess I'm third. And I did that for a year or two. And then I'm like, what am I doing? I'm just as good as these girls. I might not look the way she does or plant my pole the way she does, but I got fire inside me and I want to win too. I don't want to take second. I don't want to take third. I'm going to compete. And there was a change in my mental thought. I think after one of my trips to Europe and you know, Dave and I really sat down to start writing goals for me. That really helped me too, is to understand the process along the way. And it wasn't like every meet I needed to go out and jump a world record. We earmarked a certain time of the year where we would really try to go for it. Um, and along the way, we knew there was a buildup phase. And I selected meets, you know, appropriately um, to set me up. And, but I wanted to be with the best of the girls because the best girls brought out the best in me. Um, and so I wanted, I wanted that competition. I thrived on that competition. Once I made that choice to say, you know what, I can win this too. And, and, and that really was a huge uh, turning point for me. Awesome. Um, I'm going to throw out one more question, um, which again, kind of goes with the, um, a question that I asked before, uh, you know, being the pioneer of, for the women in the pole vault, um, is there, um, kind of what, changes have you seen in the women's pole vault from kind of where you were when you first to to today and then advice do you have advice for young young women that are looking to jump um or get into the pole vault yeah um it's so fun to watch the women now i mean it was fun to watch when when i was competing but i just um there's so many girls that run so fast, right? Um, they work on their speed all of the time. The guys work on their speed. I mean, like I said in the presentation, you need to work on your run. And when you have a solid run, then you can start working on the other elements. But if you're coming in and you're balking at your takeoff, you're not going to have a great jump. So all the great coaches out there work on run and sprint mechanics. Um, that's just a given. And if you can supplement with some gymnastics training, that's going to make the flow of the jump even better, right? 
So I see a lot of the girls doing aspects of gymnastics and uh, this era isn't a bunch of gym, ex gymnasts. When I started competing, it was a lot of the gymnasts that outgrew the gym or got hurt in gym and then found gym or the pole vault after gymnastics. So, um, but uh, I think, I think it's just, it's so empowering to have come from where I've come, where a lot of people thought that women couldn't do this event because we didn't have the upper body strength that, that we would hurt our reproductive system. And now, you know, the bar has set really high and there's more world records to be achieved. I think, I think that's so exciting. And it's, it's really empowering as a female to know that for me, that, that I've been a part of that. Um, you know, I was told many a times that this is going to come and go. It's a novelty event. And that spurred me to keep going. And, you know, I still think that there's women being told that, you know, oh, they can't jump 16 feet or they can't jump 16, five or 17 feet. I think 17 feet is doable. And I thought it was doable when I was competing. I mean, that was, that was the ultimate, right? 16 feet is what I wanted, but I thought, let's keep pushing the bar to 17 feet. And I, I think there's a couple ladies out there that can do it. And that's, that's amazing, right? I work with, with guys that are having a hard time jump six, 17 feet. So to, for a girl, for a young lady, young woman to come out there, bring it down the runway and go for it. I love it. You know, this is, it's really empowering for, for women. Um, and I think training as a pole vaulter, um, it's so many different aspects, right? We talk about gymnastics. We talk about being in the weight room. We talk about throwing med balls around. We're just, pole vault is an amazing event, right? And it encompasses so much different training. And I'm just really fortunate that I had the opportunity to do it, that I had a coach that picked me out of a crowd to try it. And I just encourage anybody that's out there that's training for the pole vault to keep working hard at it. It's, it's a process. I'm not going to lie. It's not an easy road but it's a very rewarding road. And once you feel that bend in a pole and it shoots you in the sky, you want more. And, um, and from a coaching you know, um, position, when you get an athlete that finally that light bulb turns on and, and they're moving poles and they're connecting with the pole, that is such a fun feeling you know, to help teach that next generation of athletes, whether it's a female or male. I love it. I love the puzzle of it. I love, um, not everybody's trained the same way. We have to find our strengths and weaknesses. And, and that's the fun, fun component of being a coach. Awesome. And, and so that leads me to the final question that I have here is that from going from being an, an athlete to going to being a coach, what is one of the things that you found really easy? And what is one of the things that you found really difficult uh, in that transition? As we have many people that are former pole vaulters moving into becoming coaches, um, what are some, some easy things that you found in that transition and then some difficult things that maybe you're still working on? It's hard to not know what the athlete is thinking, if their mind is right. <laughs> um, even watching my husband, you know, he's a world-class discus thrower. I remember being at the trials with him and I'm like, does he have it today? Is he going to throw what he needs to throw to make the team? As an outsider looking in, like, in athletes easy like you know what you prepare for or at least i did and yeah there's there's jitters there's that adrenaline that you know okay put that first bar up and then it's then it's just get back to clockwork work on the cues that your coach and you have worked on and 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 execute those jumps those perfect jumps those jumps that are your jumps like scott kendrick's talk, talked about it's you hone in on what you've done in training and um for my athletes hopefully we've we've set we've set the stage at practice, right? We've, we've done the jumps. And when we go to a competition, we hope that we can glorify what they've been doing in practice is what, you know, we try not to make that many changes in, mm -hmm. in a competition, but we get to glorify what they've been doing, all the hard work they put in at, in practice. Um, it's hard though, you know, as a coach, it's, it's really hard because you don't know, you know, they're young, they're still trying to figure things out. Is their mindset right? Um, so that's that relationship that you have to grow with your athlete. And that's, that's a fun component of it as well. Um, I'm very fortunate to have a, a facility. You know, I've dreamed of having a facility. We're able to, to buy a building a couple years ago and, and I have a great pit. I have a great selection of UCS poles that I love, my kids love, and I'm able to pick poles off the wall for any given kid at any time. You know, we do a lot of training on smaller poles. I'm not going to lie. 
and it gives them a lot of confidence to move a pole. And then once they're ready to move back to a fuller run, we go to stiffer poles and we make sure that things are sound and safe and we just keep growing in that manner. Um, so for coaches out there that don't have all the, you know, the luxuries of having a facility and having the selection of poles, I, I would say is to, to grow your inventory. It's, it's really hard to go to a meet and not have the pole that you need for the right situation. And I'm guilty of it. When I see a kid struggling, whether it's from my club or not, I'll lend a pole because I want the kid to advance. I want, you know, it's hard enough to be a pole vaulter. And when you don't have the right equipment, I'll help a kid out. I have no problem with that. As long as they're jumping safe and sound. And I have made a conversation with the coach like, hey, I got this pole if you want it. And it works out, you know, I wanna see the kids excel, um, su succeed in the sport. It's really hard. And when you don't have the right equipment, it's even harder. So, um, so it's it's fun living here in, in a smaller community that I that I live in and try to help these coaches and we have really great knowledgeable coaches and there's some coaches that don't know what they're doing and, and I'm here to help them and help their kids excel and, and fulfill their dreams. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um mm -hmm. so that kind of uh well that exhausts the questions that came in and the questions that I that I had. Um I just want to just tell you how grateful we are to have you um, as a pioneer in the women's pole vault and, and kind of forging the way that you did for us and for many of the women uh, in the United States and definitely across the world as I have people tuning in and saying thank you from Portugal and other places like that. So um, thank you so much for taking the time tonight to, to share your story, uh, give us some technique, and then also tell us about all the wonderful things that you're doing uh, still to give back to the pole vault. So that is that is awesome. And uh, thank you very much for your time this evening and everything that you've done uh, for the pole vault. Absolutely. Well, I just I want to give a shout out to all the coaches that have helped me that have inspired me. All of you guys are up on the panel, Butler, Layman, you know, Greg Hall. Um, I think who else is out there? I don't know who else is out there. But um, I just want to thank you. You you've all inspired us. You've given given a lot of credit to the women, you supported the women's, uh, pro, you know, uh, development in the sport. And if it wasn't for, for a lot of the coaches out there that are on the panel, um, women's pole vault would not exist. Right. And we're just very thankful. And, um, it has really just been a blessing in my life, uh, to be able to have done what I've done and then to be able to give back. And, and it's exciting to see what this next generation is going to, um, have in store for them. And, um, the heights that they will soar over and our, our Olympians that are training right now. And I'm super bummed that, you know, the Olympics are going to be postponed, but it's, it's all for the better. We're all going to be stronger for it. And you're going to be stronger for it because you're going to be able to do some gymnastics training now. So come <laughs> see me in Boise, Idaho. <laughs> I'll help you out and we'll have some awesome success. Perfect. So to those of you that are out on YouTube, thank you very much for tuning in. Um, our next uh, presenter will be up on May 20th, uh, Coach Dennis Mitchell from Akron uh, University. And again, don't forget to share the good word with your pole vault friends and the pole vault community out there on YouTube and get them to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. So thank you to our fans out on YouTube and uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right.